You are listening to ChartingWealth.com's weekly review and forecast for the week beginning Monday, the 14th of November, 2016. We're going to jump right into these markets. What do we have going on on our weekly chart with the total market? It is still in a confirmed down move. However, we have seen over the course of this last week a kink up that is following Donald Trump's election as President of the United States and the markets are covering. We're going to go over the news here in just a minute and talk about all the excitement from the industries that are most affected potentially by Trump, infrastructure, financial, pharmaceuticals. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. But the market originally, those of you paying attention, like I'm sure all of you were, we expected that if Trump won, the markets would go down. That's what we were told. It's going to be terrible in America if Trump wins. And what happens if Hillary wins? The markets will soar because everything will be in great hands. Well, <laughs> that is not. And we told you, don't be in the market because we don't know what in the hell is going to happen. Well, what happened? Well, of course, Trump wins and the markets at first, we see the futures drop, but then it recovers and things soar and we have an up week in the total market. Of course, the two-day chart is bounding upwards and we see all of that downward pressure being relieved at least momentarily for the time being. The derivative oscillators lost some of its downward momentum. Don't have a crossover going up yet. We're not calling the weekly chart up. The weekly chart, for those of you who follow using your daily market worksheet, market down, market down, but we'll continue to watch and just see what occurs. Now, if we look at what went on throughout the course of the week on the daily chart, very interesting to watch. The week started, of course, on Monday the 7th. It was an up day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, a little bit of petering off, actually. Did not open and move above the last day's gains on Thursday. So it's a red open box candle, no down wick, just an up wick. But again, the derivative oscillator continued to climb higher on Friday, and we saw that the MACD or the PPO, the price percent oscillator, continued to move up. Not exactly the same strength. It lost a little bit of that energy, but again, still moving up. That's where we are on the total market. Now let's jump into the S&P 500. Oh, for the record, total market down 0.07% for the day on Friday. The S&P 500 down 0.23% on Friday. But again, S&P 500 is still in a downtrend. It did, however, push through the weekly trend line over the course of the week. Again, a green up candle with a long wick, a long, long wick on top. A lot of exuberance that was only exuberance. It lost that energy. The bears were able to pull it down. Now, we also see a kink up on what had been down movement on the PPO. Derivative oscillator lost some of its energy, but still in a confirmed down move. However, pushing through that trend line is, is potentially significant, but the most significant thing would be a crossover going up, which has not happened yet. We'll see how the market settles out over the course of the next week. Now, if we look on the daily chart, starting on the 7th, Lots of up movement. Looks very similar to the total market. Big exuberance on Thursday, actually even pushing through the Bollinger Band. And then on Friday, not as much. A wick on top, a red open box. But again, some down movement on Friday. Lost some of the upward momentum on the PPO. However, the derivative oscillator continued to gain energy. All right. And of course, we had that crossover on Tuesday that on the daily chart moving up. Now, that's where we are on the S&P 500. Mark your daily market worksheet still in a confirmed down move. Okay, let's go to the Qs. It was actually up on Friday, 0.06%. How do we see the Qs, though, over the course of the past week? Qs is still in a confirmed down move. After crossing over going down on the week ending the 28th, it took it a while to lose all of the upward momentum. Finally happened on the weekly chart. Still in a confirmed down move. Derivative oscillator continues to heat up. And the MACD, the PPO, the price percent oscillator, continues to move down. We do have a spinning green top 
A long wick on the bottom, a long wick on the top means indecision, although when we look at our weekly chart, we're still in a confirmed down move. Like we said, unlike the other two indicators on Friday, the Qs, the NASDAQ 100, was actually up. Now let's look at the daily chart, see what happened to the Qs over the course of the week. Strong up movement on Monday the 7th, followed by strong up movement on Tuesday. And then what happened is the Qs lost energy, whereas the other markets continued to move up the other two indexes. The Qs had a red open box candle with a down wick, a little bit of a down wick on the 9th. That was Wednesday following the election. And then a spinning top with huge wicks on the top and bottom. And then a down move. So the mood crossing over going down actually on Friday, the mood is down on the Qs. So different than our other index. It's really interesting to watch. So we'll continue to pay attention to the Qs, see exactly what's happening. Remember, confirm down move on the weekly chart. Make sure to mark that down. And we see a decidedly down move even on these shorter charts. Well, that is where we are on our three indexes. What do we go to now? We go to gold. What's gold doing? Gold was down massively on Friday. 2.21% down in one day on gold. Gold is in a confirmed down move, of course, on the weekly charts. Has been since it crossed over way back on the 19th of August. Now, you might, well, actually, even before that, on the 12th, the week ending the 12th of August, gold slid sideways for quite a while, but again, it has continued to have a down mood, even though it's had up movements. Now, those of you who follow us on gold know how prescient our four-hour chart is, how good it is for a trading chart, but keep this in mind, my friends. Always remember, all things being equal, the market always tends to move in the direction of the largest chart. That's why we chart our weekly chart and keep up with it all the time. That's why you have it marked on your daily market worksheet so you know what's going on overall, where the real mood is when you know what's up with that weekly chart. That is really the key. That's the big, big wave. You may have small waves during the during all of that that might go up. But if the big wave is going down, everything's going to tend to move down. So just keep that in mind. That's important to know. Now, if we look at what happened daily during the course of the week on gold, gold was down on Monday and Tuesday, a little up spinning top on Wednesday, a lot of just, you know, it was the day after the election. Gold gained a little bit, as did the markets, and then gold rolled over hard on Thursday and Friday, crossing over going down on the PPO on the daily chart on Thursday. Now again, we talked about it was good as far as our four-hour chart to be in gold prior to the election, I'm sorry, inverse gold, but we, we just never feel safe going through an election, a big event, like a big Fed meeting where lots of stuff can be going on, or a big election. It's just dangerous. You never know which way the market's going to go. That being said now, let's talk about the news. You know that our weekly review and forecast is the only time we pay attention to the news. We listen to what affected the markets over the last week and what might be affecting the market over the coming weeks. So, what happened over the course of this last week? Well, global equities rose unexpectedly, <laughs> according to the market mavens. That's why we don't pay attention to that stuff. We pay attention to what the charts tell us. But they popped up after Trump won the presidency and his promises of U.S. physical stimulus in the wake of his election in infrastructure, in pharmaceuticals, in, in financials, they were among the best performers. Volatility also fell to 15.5% after the election outcome became clear. Now, let's talk a little more about where things sort of came from and went to. We saw that after the election, the S&P futures had dropped significantly. They had fallen within their 5% limit in after-hours trading, but then they reversed course and they gained solidly over Wednesday. They shook off those initial jitters. 
and an unex- the expected policy of tax cuts that Trump has talked about, increased spending in infrastructure and defense, along with reductions in red tape from the government. Remember, we're here from the government. We're here to help. We know what we're doing. Well, that never proves true. <laughs> and we've seen the public, the private sector, everybody be excited and the spirits be boosted in the financial markets based upon the fact that hopefully we're going to see government taking less of our money and getting out of our lives. At least that's what the market is showing right now. We also, as we get away from the U.S. a little bit, we saw that Chinese data remained muted in October, again suggesting that global demand is remaining a bit subdued, but we'll again see how things happen over the course of these next few weeks as all of this in the U.S. settles down and kicks in. We've also seen the Canadian Prime Minister has talked about reopening NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, once Trump takes over. That's going to be interesting as we see an attempt to modernize, maybe not totally renegotiate NAFTA, but modernize it for the benefit of Canada, the U.S., and potentially Mexico. We'll see how all that shakes out. What about oil? Well, world oil outlook. We've seen the the predictions on that talk about crude prices not topping $60 a barrel until the end of the decade. Wow. Well, we'll see. There's a glut of oil. And again, we'll see how that just continues to play out. You've got all these nations that want to make money producing oil. But again, if economies around the world start booming, maybe that will draw down the supply and more things will happen. We'll just have to wait and see, but I found that very interesting. $60 a barrel oil through the end of the decade. Very interesting. Okay, the effect of, uh, again, getting back to some things in the U.S., that lighter regulatory touch from the U.S. government, uh, going in and addressing Frank Dodd and the financial system, that overhaul has not fully been implemented, and we'll have to see what really happens with that. So as we start looking at things such as the EPA, uh, you notice that coal prices or coal mining, coal stocks and all, they uh, they again may start rising up through the roof as Trump has talked about coal. Remember, we're the Saudi Arabia of cold. We have super clean cold out west. We'll just have to wait and see how all that kicks in for us. And if we get back on using clean coal, we'll just have to wait and see. Also, the pharmaceutical industry boomed. Why? Well, you remember how Hillary talked about price control measures because of the government-controlled health care. Trump comes in, talks about getting rid of Obamacare and putting the free market back to work. That, that portended well for the pharmaceutical industry. So we'll continue to watch. Again, we're going to let the charts lead us, not the talking heads on the news. We pay attention to the charts, not the media noise. So let's continue to pay attention to what these long-term, medium-term, and short-term charts tell us. That's the weekly, the two-day, and the four-hour. And remember, what we look for is trends moving in all th- in all three of our trend lines moving in the same direction, then we look for that shortest chart to do a pullback that is moving the opposite direction. Once it then moves back over into the direction of the big charts, that's our jumping in point. That's, that's how simple it gets. Finding it can take some time and energy, but once you do, and once it works, particularly in the fall-winter trading zone, when moves tend to be much more clear, it's not been that way, as you all have been with us all summer long and experienced. Summertime trading stinks. That's why we have the adage, sell in May and go away, but we're out of the summer now, and we want to look for nice, clean rollovers in one direction or the other, jumping in, riding it, and doing well in the markets. Now again, we're not a stock calling service. We're talking about you setting up your own online virtual trading account, practicing with us. Once you get good, you can make up your own mind. We do not we do not call any of the market for you. We're nothing but an education firm. Lastly, let's talk about what's going on throughout the course of the coming week. Well, on Monday, 
you're going to see China release its retail sales industrial production data. Also, you're going to see Japan release its third quarter domestic, uh, gross domestic product reports. On Tuesday, you're going to see the United Kingdom's consumer price index be released along with the Eurozone's third quarter GDP. Then you're going to see also on Tuesday, another one, you're going to have U.S. retail sales thrown out. That's going to be actually put out that day. When I say thrown out, it's going to be produced. Uh, and on Wednesday, October U.S. industrial production data, as well as the minutes of the October meeting of the European Central Bank's Governing Council. So we're going to have, I'm sorry, that's going to be actually on Thursday. Wednesday is just going to be the U.S. industrial production data. So what does all this mean? No Fed meeting, no election. Markets are still absorbing what happened on Tuesday of this past week. We will just continue to watch our charts. If any of the news I just told you about, any of those releases is particularly bad or particularly good, of course it could affect things, but none of the big stuff that we've got to be really, really, really watchful of, such as this past week with an election or a big Fed meeting, a release of Fed information. So again, we're going to pay attention to our charts. We're going to look for good trades to shape up so that we can make these things work for us. Remember, these charts, the most important thing you can do for your financial future is learn to read these things. Because if you can read a stock chart, guess what, my friends? You have, you have the grail, you have the crystal ball, you have the ability to jump in and see your financial dreams come through in the market. Is it always perfect? No, it's not. That's why we set up all the rules that we set up. That's why we're careful. We never gamble. Our job is to make sure that first we preserve our capital and second, we make money. That's what it's all about. That's what we want you to learn as far as being able to read these charts. That's why you follow the rules and you keep things safe. And you know what? If you do that, if you do that, even when crazy things happen in the market and it turns against you, you can get out, you can take a minor loss, and you can play again another day. Because most of the time, the large majority of the time when you learn how to read these stock charts, the decisions you make are going to be the right ones. Again, you can't control everything in life, but you want to minimize that down risk. So practice with us. Get good at it. When you get good and you can make one trade after another, after another, after another that works, then and only then can you make up your own mind how and when you want to spend and invest your own money. Thank you so much for being with us. We love to hear from you. If you want to help us out, ask you to do two things for us. Go to iTunes, subscribe to our podcast, give us a five-star rating, say something nice about us. You guys have made us as high as number six in the world as far as stock market podcasts go. And also, go to YouTube, subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much. God bless. Hope that you have a great week practicing in the markets from chartingwealth.com.